ID the Future, a podcast about evolution and intelligent design. Welcome to ID the Future. I'm your host, Steve Dilley, and I'm pleased today to welcome Dr. Casey Luskin. Casey, great to have you on the program. Thanks for having me on, Steve. And you better call me Casey. Uh, only my wife is allowed to call me doctor. No, actually, that's not even true. <laughs> Nobody. I don't like being called doctor. I find it very strange. I, 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 you know, you call me Casey every other day of the week. So let's just go with our normal uh, routine here. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, of course, listeners to ID the Future uh, know about you, that you've been an interviewer and then expert on the program many, many times. But for those who may be new, uh, Casey holds a PhD in geology from the University of Johannesburg and bachelor's and master's degrees in earth sciences from the University of California, San Diego, and a JD also from the University of California, San Diego. He's currently the associate director of the Center for Science and Culture at Discovery Institute. And in that capacity, we work closely together. Casey, today, I want to chat with you a little bit about a paper that you co-authored, peer-reviewed paper that you published last summer in the journal Religions. It's titled, On the Relationship Between Design and Evolution. And the paper gives an extended analysis of a really formidable and interesting book, The Compatibility of Evolution and Design, which is written by a University of Helsinki theologian, Rope Kajonen. And uh, listeners should know we'll provide a link to, the, to Casey's paper in the description of this episode. Um, listeners may also know that We've done a series on Kajonan's book at ID of the Future, as well as posts on Evolution News. So we're continuing that today. Thanks for joining, Casey. Yeah, and it's also your paper, Steve. You were the lead author and did a fantastic job of uh, taking the lead and writing that paper and helping us to put all of our thoughts together into one document. And we're really, really happy with how it turned out. So thank you for that. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, it was a fun, fun project for all of us. Um, for... Those who may be just joining this series, Casey, tell us, give us a brief overview of the compatibility of evolution and design. What is Kajonan up to in the book? Yeah, so what Rope Kajonan wants to do is he wants to argue that evolution and design are compatible at very deep fundamental levels. Um, and that even uh, that design can help us or I should say evolution can help us make an argument for design. It's a very, very interesting thesis and it grabbed our attention because it was kind of a novel way of looking at things. And some folks might think, well, it doesn't sound like it's that hard to really marry or merge evolution and design into a single model because for example, you could have things that are changing over time and in that sense they're evolving and yet they're designed and we see this all the time. There's the famous example of the Corvette where you see the models of the Corvette changing through the years. It's evolving in the sense that it is changing over time, but of course all that evolution is being driven by the actions of intelligent agents who are designing and building new models of the Corvette as the years go on. So in one sense, it's not that hard to merge evolution and design. But what Rope Kajonan wants to argue is that you can actually marry evolution and design at very deep fundamental levels when it comes to the origin and evolution of life. So he would argue that mainstream evolutionary biology and everything that basically, you know, mainstream biology would say about the origin of an evolution of life is fundamentally correct, that it has been nothing but blind and mechanistic material causes all the way down back to essentially the beginning of the universe. But yet he would say that we can also make a robust case for design. And so this is sort of a novel thesis again that grabbed our attention. We thought it might be something that a lot of folks who uh, call themselves theistic evolutionists would probably find attractive. And we wanted to ask, is this actually a successful merger of evolution and design? Does he actually make a case that works? And just to sort of give a sneak peek at the punchline, what we found is that it might be possible 
to live in a universe that Rope Kajonan predicts, where basically um, the universe is designed from the very beginning to allow for evolution to work. There's sort of all this front loaded information built into the laws of nature, the laws of the universe, the initial conditions of the universe to allow evolution to unfold in a totally sort of blind and, you know, unguided in the sense that it operates on its own without any um, external guidance whatsoever. And so basically the universe just does its thing and all of life evolves through natural mechanisms. You could potentially, you know, create a universe like that. But when we look at where Kajonan says that we're supposed to find evidence for the universe being designed so that evolution can work, we don't see that the universe is actually designed in that way. The universe does not appear to be designed in a way that Rope Kajonan proposes to allow evolution to work. And we'll get into this in more detail. So ultimately, we basically said that his argument fails on the facts. And also we found that if his argument was, was valid, it actually would do harm to our ability to detect design. I'm sure we'll get into that too. Yeah, that sounds great. And thank you for that overview, Casey. Obviously, the paper itself is pretty involved. It's a, it's a very long treatment, 25,000 words or so. And you were intimately involved in the whole thing and in particular sections, particular sub-arguments used to evaluate Rope's thesis. Um, take us through some of the particular sections that you were uh, really closely involved with in the paper, really the whole thing, but um, were the lead thinker in some particular areas. Yeah, and maybe I could tell a little bit of the background here um, also of how we got involved with this. I mean, I've known Rope Kajonan and his work for a number of years. I would say I think very highly of his work, even though I, I don't always agree with what he's arguing. He is a very careful and thoughtful thinker. And I found that he often will, uh, for example, when he describes intelligent design, he's very careful to make sure that he's representing it accurately. Even if he doesn't fully agree with, say, folks like Behe or Dembski or Meyer, uh, he's tr very careful in trying to make sure that he describes ID accurately. And he often also will respond to critics of intelligent design in a way that I would say, you know, I, I often agree with him. And he says, no, look, I, you know, I, whether or not he agrees with intelligent design, he'll say, this is not a very good objection to intelligent design. And he will, he'll do a, do a good job of responding to those objections. So I've, I've often found Rope Kajonan's uh, work, his papers, his books to be very thoughtful and carefully argued. His book, The Compatibility of Evolution Design, was no exception to that. So when this book came out, I thought, you know, I think that we as a team at Discovery should go through the book very carefully, do a book club. And that's what we did back in 2022, which led to this paper. So, you know, I guess in a way, like having known of his work for a while and, and thought uh, highly of Rope Kajonan's work, I wanted us to look at this carefully. It sort of came from out of that, that this paper came from. But when it came to actually writing the paper, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly was involved with with all, I think all of us who co-authored the paper, uh, you, uh, me, Brian Miller, Emily Reeves, we were all involved with the whole thing, but certainly uh, was very, uh, did a lot of dialoguing with you about the framing. What, what did we actually think about his argument? Um, the biggest section I probably worked on was the material on the bacterial flagellum. Um, also uh, helped, uh, Brian Miller with his uh, with the protein evolution section that was largely his brainchild, but I helped a lot with the writing of that. Um, and then worked with you on a lot of the material on design detection. And in fact, I think that one uh, sort of if I can contributed one thing to the section on design detection, it was that I really felt like that if his view of design fails, that actually has negative implications for the plausibility of mainstream evolution. And the reason why, and we'll get into this, I'm sure, but what's really interesting about Rope's, Rope Kajonan's thesis is he basically says that, look, all other things being equal, an evolutionary, a mainstream evolutionary account or a mainstream evolutionary mechanism is not usually going to work very well to build the kind of complexity of life that we see on Earth. And he says that actually for evolution to work, you need fine tuning, you need design to be built into the laws of nature to sort of give evolution a boost so that say one protein sequence can be able to evolve into another protein sequence without getting stuck in some you know non-functional stage of a fitness valley something like that in a fitness landscape where it can't traverse 
from one point to another. So he says that the fitness landscapes uh, of protein sequence space have to be fine tuned to allow for evolution to work in order to basically give evolution that helping hand it needs. But without that helping hand, without that sort of serendipitous fine tuning that he says we see in, in our universe, um, evolution's not going to work. So he sort of acknowledged that evolution is going to have a tough time, all other thing being, things being equal, um, evolution is going to have a tough time to do the job that it's got to do. But so what we found is that, okay, well, if the fine tuning that Professor Kajonan says evolution needs in order to work isn't there, then that actually has implications for whether evolution works in our universe. And of course, we we argued that we don't see that fine tuning. But again, I'm sure we'll get into that too. Yeah, that is fascinating. He's essentially said, if I understand his argument correctly, that evolution requires a very specific kind of preconditions, fine tuning. And part of your work in the paper, Casey, shows that there is no such preconditions or fine tuning. And that would, of course, have negative implications, accepting Kajonan's very framing of whether or not mainstream evolution would succeed. So yeah, let's, well, we'll circle back to that. That's a, I think a, just an excellent insight on your part. Uh, one of the sections you mentioned that you really put a lot of time and thought in is a section on the bacterial flagellum. So let, let's tunnel in on that a little bit. So start us off just in a basic way. First, what is the bacterial flagellum? Yes, yeah, so the bacterial flagellum is a very famous molecular machine which exists in uh, many prokaryotic organisms uh, to help them to essentially swim through a liquid medium to be able to find food. And it kind of looks like an outboard motor. It's this whip-like appendage that spins around, propelling it through, uh, again, some kind of a water-based medium to be able to find food. Um, and the, the flagellum, of course, has become an icon of intelligent design, sort of the, the paradigm of irreducible complexity, the idea uh, coined by Michael Behe that there are many features of biology which require a certain core number of parts in order for them to function. And if any of those parts are missing or don't work right, then they're not, that system is not going to be able to function. So essentially, he calls them irreducibly complex because you cannot reduce their complexity without them ceasing to function. And the argument has been made uh, that the bacterial flagellum is irreducibly complex. And of course, some folks will say, well, there is no one single bacterial flagellum. There's many different variations of flagella out there in biology. And there is some truth to that. There, there are you know, great variety within the world of prokaryotes of different uh, flagella. But actually, there was a paper a number of years ago in Nature Reviews Microbiology, which found that all flagella have a certain sort of core set of parts that seem to be indispensable um, and and also that they have certain core subsystems which seem to always be there. You've got to have the motor, you've got to have the anchor, you've got to have the chemotaxis system, you've got to have the appendage that spins around. So even if you know di different uh, bacteria, different types of prokaryotes have slightly different variants on their flagella, there is sort of a, a, a core set of parts that have to be there for the flagellum to work. And you do find those parts pretty universally um, around different flagella. So, I mean, uh, in general, it sounds like the bacterial flagellum counts as evidence for design. And of course, Kajonan is championing a model of designed evolution, you could say, in which he accepts full-blown mainstream evolution. And if that's the case, um, why has he discussed the flagellum? It, it would seem like it may may pose a problem, at least initially, for his theory. Why discuss it at all? Why is it in the book? Yeah, so the standard rejoinder to Michael Behe's arguments for irreducible complexity is that maybe the flagellum you know, didn't start off as a molecular machine that helps bacteria swim through, you know, or maybe the parts of the flagellum did not start off as being part of a molecular machine that helps bacteria to swim and find food. Maybe they started off having other functions in uh, biological systems and they were co-opted or there was a process of what's called exaptation, where basically parts are borrowed, tweaked, changed and retooled to perform entirely new functions in different systems. And so all the parts of the flagellum, according to the way many evolutionists will try to explain the origin of the flagellum, initially they were doing other things in other systems. They were borrowed, co-opted, 
and then they were retooled to be able to suddenly perform some new function in the flagellum. And so this kind of a model fundamentally depends on the ability of proteins to be radically retooled and reshaped to do totally new kinds of functions. And in our protein section of this paper, we saw that with Rope Kajonan, he actually tackles the evolution of proteins. And he talks about some of the research of idea theorists like Douglas Axe, who have found that functional protein sequences are actually very, very rare. And he argues, well, actually, that's not a problem for evolution, because even if protein sequences are rare, um, you might be able to have fine tuning of protein sequence space. So you can evolve from one protein sequence to another um, through sequence space, remaining functional at each small mutational step of that evolutionary pathway. And it's because the uh, essentially the fitness landscapes and protein sequence space is finely tuned to allow for these very narrow bridges through sequence space that allow you to remain functional from one protein sequence that's functional to another. So this essentially shows that the fitness landscapes of protein sequence space have been set up by God, have been fine-tuned, he argues, by God, to allow for new types of proteins to evolve. And he says that the same kind of fine-tuning would allow for the co-option of flagellar proteins, okay? That you could take some flagellar filament protein that's originally doing something totally different in a biological system, and you could tweak it and, and mutate it from whatever its initial function was until it's now being able to be co-opted to be able to function in the flagellum. And what he, he actually recognizes, it's a very interesting argument, Steve. He actually recognizes that for some kind of a co-option account of the origin of the flagellum to work, it's going to be requiring a lot of what he calls serendipity. He says, quote, there is indeed quite a bit of serendipity in parts useful for one purpose being so easily adaptable to another role. He says, it seems then that defending the power of evolutionary mechanisms requires assuming that the landscape of possible biological forms has some fairly serendipitous properties. And he says, the ability of evolution to generate teleology appears to depend on teleology. So what he's basically saying is that uh, to have these preconditions, these smooth fitness landscapes to basically connect up very different, very um, totally unique and different structures within biological uh, universe, this requires sort of a serendipitous fitness landscape that will allow these things to be able to evolve. And this shows that teleology was built or design was built into the fitness landscapes of the biological universe. Um, and so he essentially is saying that, you know, under many universes, um, a, an idea, a, a model like co-option is not going to work. But we happen to live in a universe that has been finely tuned to allow biological parts to be co-opted very easily to be able to then build new complex features like a bacterial flagellum. So essentially, our universe has been rigged to allow these things to evolve, even though normally they would be very difficult to evolve. Right. Yeah, thanks. That's helpful. So to summarize, on Kajonan's view, God created the laws of nature, and the laws of nature are such that they give rise to conditions that make evolution possible, including the formation of new proteins by selection and mutation. And with the formation of new proteins, you can ultimately build protein machines. You can take something like a type three system and over time cobble together a bacterial flagellum. So the universe is set up to allow for evolution to occur. And then I think he also says, when you get something like the bacterial flagellum, that does actually count as evidence for design. It seems uh, on his view that something like that would be too sophisticated to come about by chance, say chance processes or in a naturalistic universe. So he, that, he's, he thinks the bacterial flagellum counts for design, but just in, in an evolved way. That's exactly right, Steve. He sees design in the flagellum. In fact, he says that Behe's argument for ir irreducible complexity, quote, could simply reveal the extent to which fine tuning is required by evolution. So he says, look, irreducible complexity, it's there. It's very, it's a very robust case for design. It's a very elegant system. This shows even more 
to the extent that evolution requires fine tuning in order for it to work because it has to have fine tuning. The universe has to be very specially set up in order for evolution to be able to work to build these complex features. So it's a very interesting argument. So this is interesting then because so much of his case for design here hinges on fine tuning in a very particular way so that you get proteins evolving to others so that you get the emergence of protein machines. So um, when it comes to the flagellum in particular, um, take us through that, Casey. What what makes you think that Kajonin's case for design is suspect here when it comes to how the design how design is supposed to come about on his view via evolutionary processes? Yeah, so so he has to be able to make a case that the flagellum actually can evolve in our universe that we see that there is design in the fitness landscapes of our of protein sequence space. And we see that, you know, the, the flagellum reflects its evolutionary history. And so what he uh, relies upon essentially is what many folks have relied upon when they've argued that the flagellum could arise through these co-option exaptation type models. Uh, and basically it comes down to what is called protein homology, where he argues that because two proteins are similar to each other, therefore that shows that they share some evolutionary history. And this is evidence that the system evolved. And he basically makes a very standard kind of evolutionary argument for the evolution of the flagellum. Well, there's a number of problems with citing homology of flagellar proteins to argue that the flagellum evolved. Number one, um, you can't say that sequence similarity, really what this homology means is it just means that flagellar proteins have similar amino acid sequences to other proteins out there in the quote unquote biological universe. Uh, the first problem though, and Michael B. He talks about this in, in his books, that we shouldn't confuse sequence similarity with evidence for a step-by-step -step evolutionary pathway. Um, that uh, there's a th that you know you need to be able to demonstrate an evolutionary pathway, and sequence similarity alone does not show that. Um, and then when we talk about whether or not flagellar proteins actually are homologous, um, he cites a couple of sources to claim that about 90% of the parts of the flagellum are similar or homologous to other parts in biology. So we went through uh, his sources and the uh, sort of the citations and the arguments that they made very carefully and found that really when you look at the data, um, it's there's not it's not the case that 90 percent of flagellar proteins show homology to other systems. Um, it's really at best only four out of the 42 proteins uh, that uh, were cited in these sources. So that's about 10 percent are homologous to, quote, similar parts in other systems, as he puts it, and could have potentially served as precursors to the flagellum. Uh, quite a few of the proteins belong to another molecular machine called the type three secretory system. And this has often been cited as an evolutionary precursor to the flagellum. In fact, uh, Kajonin calls it a potential precursor to the flagellum, but there are a number of reasons why the type three secretory system could not be an evolutionary precursor to the flagellum. For one, uh, bacterial flagella are found very widespread among many different kinds of bacteria. And so it's sort of according, if you look at it from an evolutionary standpoint, that suggests that flagella go very deep in the evolutionary phylogeny. They rose very early in the history of bacteria because they're widespread among many types of bacteria. The type three secretory uh, system in contrast is only found in a very narrow range of bacteria. And that suggests it's a much later innovation and that its genes are much younger than bacterial flagellum. Um, so a number of folks have actually argued that rather than the uh, the type three secretory system being a precursor to the flagellum, it's probably more likely the other way around, that flagella have to be older than the type three secretory system. And if they are related, the flagellum is a precursor. Uh, and also we have to consider what is the type three secretory system used to do? It's used by certain bacteria that actually predate upon eukaryotic cells, okay? Well, eukaryotes arose much very late in the history of life compared to when uh, bacteria first arose. Uh, and flagella are used by you know all kinds of bacteria that don't predate upon bacteria to be able to swim around and find food. So it seems like the type three secretory system is something that arose much later in the history of life. So the bottom line is 
that what Rope Kajonan wants to argue that we see all this sequence homology between flagellar proteins and parts in other systems. This shows that they could have been co-opted. This shows that the flagellum evolved. We just don't see that the vast majority of that sequence homology. And when it does show up, we don't see it in systems that look like they could have been evolutionary precursors to the flagellum. So we just don't see this sort of this fitness landscape, this, this evolutionary pathway that led to the flagellum that Kajonan predicts had to have been there. So this sounds like, Casey, um, I mean, uh, I suppose a listener could say, hey, wait a minute. It sounds like you're criticizing Kajonan's view of evolution, you know, have about how in an in evolutionary history the bacteria or flagellum evolved. Um, but of course, Kajonan takes evolution as a given, mainstream evolutionary theory as a given. And from that basis, tries to harmonize that view with intelligent design in biology. So bring it home here for the listener. What does your analysis of Kajonan's case have to do with criticizing his view of design, his version of design itself, or of his version of design and its harmony with evolutionary theory? Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, our critique aims at Kajonan's view of design. He thinks that the laws of nature and fitness landscapes and, and so on, that they're fine-tuned to allow for random, random mutation and blind selection to evolve proteins and molecular machines that are made out of these proteins. And for that's why he talks about the bacterial flagellum. But we argue in the paper and we show in the paper that we don't see this design, this fine tuning of the laws of nature to allow for these proteins and molecular machines to be able to evolve. And really the meat of this argument goes back to the section on protein evolution in the paper, where we say that we don't, we see, do not see that fitness landscapes of sequence space are finely tuned to allow for one protein sequence to be able to evolve into a very different kind of protein. And that then extends into his arguments for the flagellum. We don't see that proteins are co-optable because we don't see that proteins are easily uh, easy to evolve. So when we see you know careful analysis of these fitness landscapes, uh, the proteins and these molecular machines that are made of proteins, they show that the kind of design that Professor Kajonan has in mind for our universe simply doesn't exist. And the empirical data basically run counter to his conception of design. And so we would argue that if his conception of design fails, if it's not what we find in the, in the real world and the universe we live in, then his attempt to put design and evolution together likewise has problems. So that's why we get into this. But, you know, we also had to address along the way, some of his specific claims that the flagellum, you know, 90% of its proteins show homology. He's making those claims. It's part of his case that the universe is designed to make evolution work. And we had to, we had to look at those very carefully to show that it, it didn't work. Yeah. So in one sense, you're just correcting errors, biological errors about a certain percentage of homologous parts and so on. And in another sense, you're taking his particular conception of design seriously on its own terms and asking, are there these fine-tuned preconditions? Do proteins come about in the way that he says they do? Are landscapes, fitness landscapes smooth, which would all be crucial to his conception of how a design like the bacteria flagellum came about? Okay, um, that's helpful. So that is really aimed at his understanding of design itself, sort of stepping back a little bit. You know, as you, as you mentioned, uh, the bacterial flagellum has been around for a long time. Michael Behe made it famous. It does Behe's, you know, big picture intelligent design now, does Behe's classic argument for the bacterial flagellum still hold up? Is it still good evidence of design in a, uh, in a, in a, obviously in a different way that Kaj than Kajonan has in mind. We would argue definitely, yes. I, I have yet to see a stepwise evolutionary account of the bacterial flagellum. Instead, you see these very vague appeals to co-option. And what is the evidence for co-option? Well, it almost essentially always comes down to sequence similarity, protein homology between flagellar proteins and other proteins that are out there. And I'm sorry, but that does not make for a stepwise evolutionary pathway. And even the sequence homology that we see is often quite suspect when you look at it closely. It really does not hold up on closer scrutiny to give you any clues about how the flagellum might have evolved. So yes, I do think Behe's arguments still hold up. One final question. As you mentioned earlier on this episode, 
Kajonan argues that evolution, even mainstream evolution on its own, is impotent on its own. It can't produce biological complexity. It can't produce flora and fauna and that it needs design. It needs designed preconditions, smooth fitness landscapes and so on. And you've argued in the case of the bacteria flagellum, in the case of proteins, that there are there are no design preconditions in the way that Kajonan specifies. What does this imply for his model? What does this imply for mainstream evolutionary theory? I think you had a really profound insight there. Take us through it. Well, thanks, Steve. I don't think I have profound insights very often, so it's good to hear that I that I had yeah. one here. I, I think what was going on as we read through Rope Kajonan's book, the compatibility of evolution and design is we we would see these comments where he would essentially say, look, evolution is going to require a lot of serendipity or fine tuning in order for it to work. So essentially what he was acknowledging is that all other things being equal and an unguided evolutionary mechanism, random mutation, natural selection, et cetera, is going to struggle to produce a lot of the complexity that we see in life. And so that's why he argues that our universe needs design. It needs this fine tuning in order for evolution to be able to work and get the job done to build the complexity of life. But the implication of that is that, you know, all other things being equal, evolution is actually not a very good mechanism without design, without this helping hand from the design that comes in the form of the fine tuning of the universe and the laws of nature. Without that helping hand, evolution's not going to work. And so there's sort of this implicit our part of his argument that evolution is going to struggle to produce the complexity of life. So if this design that he proposes has to be there to help evolution to work, if that design isn't there, then that has huge implications for the validity of evolutionary theory in our universe. And we would argue that actually we don't see evidence for that fine tuning and that that therefore has really profound implications for the overall, I guess, efficacy of evolution to produce the complexity of life. If this helping hand isn't there, then evolution is in trouble. And that's sort of the way that we left it at the end of our paper. You know, we're not trying to critique evolution generally, but he sort of put evolution on the, the chopping block here by saying it needs this design in order to work. But then when we find that that design that he's looking for isn't there, that actually means that evolution isn't going to work. And some other kind of design, not evolutionary design, maybe some other form of design is needed to explain what we see. Thank you, Casey. That That is really well put. Uh, thank you for being on the program. Great to chat with you. Um, for our listeners, please note that this is just one episode in our ongoing examination of Kajonan's book, The Compatibility of Evolution and Design. And do note that we also have an ongoing series on the same topic at Evolution News and that Casey's co-authored paper, a link to it, will be in the description of this episode. Once again, I'm Steve Dilley with ID the Future, and thanks for listening. Visit us at idthefuture.com and intelligentdesign.org. This program is Copyright Discovery Institute and recorded by its Center for Science and Culture.